evening, everybody. My name is Tom Morgan, and I'm here to welcome you to the second in four uh, programs that we have this academic year on the subject of food. And does food have a future? That's the basic question we're asking. Um, tonight's lecture, as so many of them are, is sponsored by the Allworth Center for the Study of Peace and Justice and funded in part by the Lee and Rose Warner Foundation, the AHH Zeppa Family Foundation, the Global Awareness Fund of the Duluth Superior Area Community Foundation, Whole Foods Co-op of Duluth, and Weekly, Weekly Reader, and also special support from the DeWitt and Carolyn Van Evra Foundation and from Mary C. Van Evra in memory of William P. Van Evra, former trustee of the college. Thanks, as always, to our sponsors, without whose support we wouldn't be able to bring you these talks year after year. Thank you very much. Um, one other announcement, just I think you all got these flyers. We tried something um, new uh, earlier this month, and I think it worked fairly well. Uh, Talkback sessions. Um, I'm, hope, I'm sure that this lecture you will find stimulating and lots to think about. And so um, we're offering you an opportunity to get together and chat about it in a conversation um, at Gloria Day Lutheran Church uh, this coming Monday at 7 p.m. And the facilitator will be Becky Lowry, uh, former Minnesota State Senator and uh, gubernatorial candidate. So that's, uh, that's on Monday. Uh, the next two lectures are in January and March, so I'll spare you all the details on that. But I hope you can come to those as well. Our speaker this evening is the Paulette Goddard Professor of Nutrition in the Department of Nutri Nutrition, Food Studies, and Public Health at New York University. She also holds appointments as Professor of Sociology at NYU's College of Arts and Sciences and as a visiting professor of Nutritional Sciences in the College of Agriculture at Cornell University. <coughs> professor Nessel has earned a PhD in uh, Molecular Biology and a Master's in Public Health Nutrition, both from the University of California at Berkeley. Back in the 1980s, she was Senior Nutrition Policy Advisor in the Department of Health and Human Services and Managing Director of the 1988 Surgeon General's Report on Nutrition and Health. She's been a member of the FDA Food Advisory Committee and the Science Board and the USDA Human Services Committee Dietary Guidelines for 1995 and the American Cancer Society Committee's that issue dietary guidelines, guidelines for cancer prevention. Her research focuses on the analysis of scientific, social, cultural, and economic factors that influence dietary recommendations and practices. She's the author of Food Politics, How the Food Industry Influences Nutrition and Health, and Safe Food, Bacteria, Biotechnology, and Bioterrorism, she is co-editor with Beth Dixon of Taking Sides, Clashing Views on Controversial Issues in Food and Nutrition. And her most recent books include What to Eat and Pet Food Politics, The Chihuahua in the Coal Mine. <laughs> and still another volume is slated to come out next year. It's called What Pets Eat. In addition, she blogs at www, you write this down, whattoeatbook.com, and she writes a Food Matters column for the San Francisco Chronicle. Her books, her articles, and her activism have earned her numerous awards, honors from organizations as varied as the James Beard Foundation, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and the American Public Health Association. What's more, she tells me she really likes to eat. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Marion Nessel. Thank 
water there and it was right there. there. Uh, thank you, Tom. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, you could be watching Obama's advertisement. Or maybe you already did. The, uh, in any case, it's a very exciting time to be here, and I feel very privileged to be part of this really remarkable panel of speakers that you're going to be having on the topic of the future of food. I think it has a future. Um, what I'm going to be doing tonight is talking about my own work, and I probably should do it away from that, shouldn't I? Um, and I'll be showing slides that will move fairly quickly. Um, my own work deals with food systems, and what I mean by food systems is the relationship between agriculture, food, nutrition, and health, uh, particularly obesity and food safety are the two areas that I focus on. And my starting position for this is always public confusion about diet and health. The public is enormously confused about what to eat um, and are just the, find the research confusing, the choices confusing, and are just completely bewildered by it. And I think that's really too bad because I don't think you have to be a genius to figure out what it is that you're supposed to have for supper. In fact, it's so simple that I can summarize it in one slide, which is eat less, move more, eat plenty of fruits, vegetables, and whole grains, and wild Minnesota rice. Um, don't, eat, don't eat too much junk food. Enjoy what you're eating, and please don't eat my book. Um, but if it sounds confusing, and if it is confusing, it's surely because of what's happening in this country with obesity, and in fact throughout the world. It's not only that rates of obesity have enormously increased from 1987 to 1997 to 2007, uh, shown here. The redder the map of the United States gets, uh, the heavier everybody is. Um, but it's also something that affects our children and we worry about what that means for their future health. And what's, in fact, rates of obesity have been going up so rapidly that by some estimations, um, nearly half or more of the population will be overweight or obese by, two th by 2030. And it's not, we're not talking here about a cosmetic problem, we're talking here about a problem that is related to a number of diseases. Um, one's body weight or body mass index, which is a function of weight and height, is directly related to rates of type 2 diabetes. And in fact, they're so closely related that rates of overweight, obesity, and type 2 diabetes track almost exactly in parallel um, on this slide from 1990 to 2000. So we have this problem, this potentially very difficult public health nutrition problem, and, it's, uh, and it poses an enormous amount of problems, not only for the people who are involved, but it also poses a tremendous problem for the food industry. And I was interested to see this quotation in Advertising Age last year with an executive of Coca-Cola who uh, told Advertising Age that the obesity epidemic or the obesity problem used to be something that food companies could ignore. They could just pretend that it didn't have anything to do with them and that the problem would just go away. Whereas today, it just confronts them in every possible area of their businesses and they're having to deal with it all the time. And it poses a huge, huge issue for the food industry. Well, the reason why it poses a, a problem for the food industry is very simple. If you're going to lose weight, you have to eat less or move more, but we'll talk about the move more part of it in a minute. But the eating less problem, it's very bad for business if people eat less. And that in itself raises a whole series of problems, and that's really what I'm going to be talking about tonight. Um, if, if you're going to deal with, uh, I can see that we're having electronic difficulties. If you're going to, and you can't see the words on this, if you're going to deal with the problem of obesity, there are really two approaches to it. The first is the personal responsibility um, approach shown here. There's a quotation in this offensive cover issue of The uh, Economist. There's a quotation in it that says, um, 
if, if people want to eat their way to illness and an early grave, let them. That's the personal appro uh, responsibility approach. If you're going to um, be overweight, it's your fault. You're responsible for it. And if we, as health professionals, are going to try to intervene in that, our job is simply to teach individuals how to eat more healthfully. That's our job. Well, teaching individuals how to eat more healthfully hasn't worked very well. And that's because of the second reason, which, has, which the New York Times a few years ago referred to as the gorge yourself environment. More food, more choices, and far more eating. And here, if you're going to intervene, we're talking about a problem, of, a societal problem that leads people to overeat. Here, you have to change society. And of course, changing society is much more difficult to do, um, even in theory, than just trying to educate individuals about how to eat better. So if we're going to talk about changing society, we have to ask the question, what is it about society that needs to be changed? And here, we need to go back to the early 1980s, which is when rates of obesity started to increase. In the early 1980s, um, up until the early 1980s, rates of obesity stayed pretty constant. Starting in the early 1980s, they began to go up quite dramatically. So we need to ask the question, what happened in the early 1980s that made people either eat more and move less or do one or the other? Um, and let me deal with the uh, moving less issue right away. It's very, very difficult to get information about people's activity levels but most of the evidence that's available indicates that rates of physical activity have not changed very much since the early 1980s. This is one piece of um, research that the Centers for Disease Control did between 1994 and 2004 in which um, they looked at rates of inactivity. Rates of inactivity declined very, very slightly during that period. If inactivity is going down, it means activity is going up. So what this means in practice is that rates of activity um, have either increased a little bit or uh, not at all. But there's not been much change. In contrast, there is plenty of evidence. Um, oh, this is really interesting. We must have incompatible electronics. I'm sorry about that. The um, uh, rates of uh, rates of of food consumption have increased with no question at all. There are two ways of looking at the number of calories that people are eating. One is the number of calories that are available in the food supply, which is the number of calories that's produced in the United States, less exports plus imports. And it went up from, from 3,200 calories a day in um, the early 1980s until the present 3,900 calories, an increase of 700 calories a day during that period. Now that's not what people are actually eating. That's what's available for consumption. The other figure is to ask people what they're eating and figure out the number of calories from that, but everybody underestimates the number of calories they're eating. And so that shows an increase from 1,900 calories a day in the early 1980s until the present 2,100, an increase of 200 calories. Well, the truth is somewhere in between. But there is no question whatsoever that people in general are, are eating more calories now than they did in the early 1980s. Calorie intake has gone up. So you have to ask the question, why? Why are people eating more now than they did in the early 1980s? And there are three reasons. The first one is always to blame moms, always. Um, mothers went back into the workforce um, and therefore created, they didn't want to cook anymore and created a demand for convenience. Well, if you look at this slide, you can see that mothers started going back into the workforce in the early 1950s. And by 1980, most of the rise in number of women going into the workforce had already occurred. It still had a way to go, but there was still, but most of it had occurred. So I don't think you can blame mothers going into the workforce for this. There are much larger forces at work. One of those has to do with agricultural policy. 
Um, in the 1970s, agricultural policy changed from paying farmers not to grow food to paying farmers to grow as much food as they possibly could. And by the early 1980s, we were growing phenomenal amounts of food. Um, and we had corn awash in a sea of farm subsidies, as this article shows. Um, what that did was several things. It continued a very, very long-term trend of decreasing the proportion of income that Americans spent on food, so that by the 1980s, um, Americans spent a little over 10% of their income on food, and now it's even less than that. And that's not only because we're so rich, it's also because of farm policies that were deliberately designed to keep the cost of basic food commodities very low. The other thing that it did was what I've already showed you. If you're growing more food, there's going to be more calories in the food supply. And calories in the food supply went from 3,200 a day to 3,900 a day. That had a big effect on the food industry. If you're a food company trying to sell your product, situation in which there are 3,900 calories a day for every man, woman, and child in the country, and on average, an adult needs 2,000 calories a day. You're trying to sell your food product in an environment in which there are twice as many calories available as anybody needs. You've got a big problem trying to sell food under those circumstances. But that's not all. Because the third thing that happened in the early 1980s was the advent of what is called the shareholder value movement. That is, and that was a movement that was attributed to Jack Welch, who was then the uh, head of General Electric, who gave a speech in 1981 saying, enough blue chip st stocks, enough of these blue chip stocks that give slow and steady returns on investment throughout your life. We investors want immediate higher returns on investment, and we want them now. And the shareholder value movement, which immediately was taken up by Wall Street, um, had an enormous effect on what was um, on, on the way that Wall Street rated food companies. What it did was it forced all companies to grow in order to maintain their status on Wall Street. It wasn't enough that they made a profit. They had to grow their profits every 90 days and report quarterly growth to Wall Street. And so that's where you see all these articles in the paper all the time, where Wall Street is closely evaluating how companies uh, come close to meeting their growth targets. So for food companies, this is especially difficult because they were already trying to sell products in a situation in which there was twice as much food available as anybody needed. Now they had to do that and grow profits at the same time. So in order to do that, they changed society. Um, and they didn't change society because people were sitting around a conference table saying, let's figure out how to make Americans fat. They changed because they were sitting around a conference table saying, how are we going to grow our profits every quarter in a situation in which where it's, that's so competitive. So they changed society inadvertently, and here's how they did it. And in the next series of slides, every time you see an exclamation point, if you can see the exclamation point, uh, the, it means that research shows that under this, these circumstances, people consume more calories than they would if they were cooking for themselves or their families at home. So the first thing that happened was food was very cheap. People ate outside the home more. And food outside the home has more calories than food within the home. Um, in fact, there was, over this same time period, an enormous growth in the proportion of, food, of, of money spent on food prepared outside the home. And most of that food turns out to be fast food, most of the growth. So that over the period from the 1980s to uh, the current time, there was an increase in the proportion of food consumed outside the home that was uh, consumed in fast food outlets. Fast food is very high in calories. If you eat a lot of fast food, you're likely to be taking in more calories than you would have if you were eating at home. Portion size is the most obvious one. Um, larger portions have more calories. 
Uh, the, uh, the red line on this, uh, on this slide is the line you've already seen. It's the increase in calories in the food supply from 3,200 to 3,900. The blue bars are research work done by my former doctoral student, now Dr. Lisa Young, who measured the introduction and, and, and researched the introduction of larger size portions into the food supply. And what she found is shown here, where until the early 1980s, foods stayed at about the same size. Starting in the early 1980s, they began to get much bigger. Part of that was that the cost of basic food commodities is very low, and part of that was that people love having more food because it's a bargain, without thinking of what the consequence of that might be. Larger portions have more calories. Um, here's Lisa at her doctoral dissertation defense, um, and then also with the book that she later wrote. And the white cup that's on the left is a standard Department of Agriculture serving size for a soft drink. If it doesn't have too much ice in it, it holds, it's eight ounces and it holds about 100 calories. The double gulp cup on the left, and she bought these cups at our local movie theater in Manhattan. The double gulp on the, on the right is if it doesn't have too much ice, holds 64 ounces and 800 calories. And most of the research shows that that cup is not passed down the movie theater row and shared among many friends. It's consumed by one person. Larger portions have more calories. Larger portions have other problems as well. And this has been shown beautifully by uh, Dr. Brian Wansink in his book, he writes about it in his book, Mindless Eating. He's a professor at Cornell now at the Department of Agriculture. Um, and he, and what's shown here, or what was supposed to be shown here, uh, was his famous uh, Super Bowl experiment, where he invited his own students, who were trained in portion size research, to come to his, and they should have known better, to come to, to come to his house and watch the Super Bowl with him. And he took some of the students and put them in one room, where he gave them popcorn in two quart bowls, and he took the other group of students in the other room and gave them popcorn in four quart bowls. And then he counted up at the end of the day, at the end of the game, he counted up how much popcorn they had eaten. And what he found was that the students, um, the white bars are the four quart bowls and the blue bars are, um, excuse me, the one on the right is the four quart bowl, the one on the left is the two quart bowl, and the white bars are the number of calories they ate. So people who had the four quart bowls ate nearly twice as much popcorn as those who had had the two quart bowls, and the blue lines are their estimates of the number of calories that they had eaten, and those who had the larger portions guessed that they had eaten or underestimated the amount of calories that they were eating more than those who had had the smaller bowls. So larger portions do three things. They have more calories, they encourage people to eat more calories, and they encourage people to underestimate what they are eating by a greater proportion. So I don't think you need any more explanation of why people are eating more than larger portions. It's probably the single most important problem with the food supply. Um, another way in which society changed was putting food everywhere. And I like to ask the question, when did it become okay to eat in bookstores? Some of you can remember, I'm sure, when there were signs all over bookstores, no food or drink in here. We just won't let you near this place. We don't want you to get all that stuff all over our books. Um, in the, at the NYU library, um, when I first came to NYU 20 years ago, uh, there were signs all over the library saying no food or drink. Now there are two cafes in our student library. Um, that's a ubiquity, sells more food. Proximity is another one. One of the reasons why nutritionists are so concerned about soft drink machines and vending machines in schools is that research shows that the more vending machines there are, the more students will buy products from them. And in fact, there's almost a direct proportion between the number of vending machines and the number of products sold from them. Uh, so that's another eat more strategy. And low prices is another one. Now that's a complicated one. But one way I can illustrate some of the, 
bizarre characteristics of low prices is that if you go to McDonald's, you can still go to McDonald's outlets with $5 and you can buy five hamburgers or one salad. What's that about? Well, it's about farm policy and where the farm policy goes, as was shown by a group in Washington who, who asked the question, why would a salad cost more than a hamburger? And attributed it to the, dis the, un the um, unbalanced distribution of farm subsidies to support the, um, the production of meat and dairy products as opposed to fruits and vegetables, which the Department of Agriculture considers specialty crops. Um, now, the, as I said, the issue of uh, low prices is a very complicated one, and we're now in a period now where food prices are rising very rapidly, and I know that there are people who think that this is a good thing because food really ought to cost more. We ought to be paying for food what it's worth. But since that money isn't going to go to the farmers and it's going to hurt the poor, I don't see how it can possibly be a good thing. Um, but I worry about it a lot. Um, now, hmm, this one appeared completely. This is too bad. Um, Michelle Simon, in her book, Appetite for Profit, um, which came out a couple of years ago, describes a situation in which, um, and, and her book um, is subtitled How the Food Industry Undermines Health and How to Fight Back. Um, her, her book is really, in a way, almost, in one way, sympathetic to food companies because food companies are under enormous pressure from advocates, from regulators, from lawyers who are trying to sue them, and most emphatically from Wall Street to profit in a situation in which not only are they supposed to produce more profit, but they're supposed to solve poverty at the same time. And they're really caught in that situation. And to the obesity crisis, by going all of the stages of grief, first they went into denial, just denied that they had anything to do with it. Then they said, okay, we're going to do something about it, but on the one hand, we're going to attack our critics we're going to lobby to make sure that Congress doesn't pass any unfavorable legislation. We're going to protect ourselves. And then, as our public face, we're going to reformulate our products, make new products, and do things that will make everybody think that we're part of the solution and not part of the problem. And I want to talk about how they're doing that. Um, the, the first way that they're doing that is by trying to make their products look nutritious. And this, of course, reflects some of what Michael Pollan said in his article in the New York Times Magazine about nutritionism and then in his book in defense of food. And I would argue that nutritionism, which is talking about nutrients all the time rather than the food itself, um, is really a calorie distractor. When you talk about nutrients, you make people forget about um, how many calories the food has. And that is the strategy that the food industry is using to try to sell food products in this enormously competitive environment. And rule number one is that they use nutrition and health to sell foods, um, and these are calorie distractors. Now, this didn't become possible until 1990 when Congress passed the uh, Nutrition Labeling Act that brought us the nutrition facts label on food packages. Um, and what food companies said was, if you're going to make us admit on labels how much sodium, saturated fat, and sugars we have in our products, you really have to let us tell the public what's good about our products. And Congress agreed and forced the FDA for the first time to begin approving health claims on food products. Prior to that, the FDA said if a food company was going to advertise that cholesterol uh, might reduce the, heart, the risk of heart disease, it had to do a clinical trial and prove it. And if you just think about it for one moment, think about how difficult it would be to do a clinical trial of somebody who ate hundreds of other foods but had Cheerios for breakfast occasionally, and that's going to reduce a heart attack? Just think about it. It's going to take a little more than that, I think. Um, but in any case, by 1990, the food industry already knew 
that if they had health claims on food products, those products would sell and would sell better than products that didn't have health claims. So the FDA began approving claims under congressional orders. And these are the familiar health claims. We'll reduce the risk of heart disease. We'll reduce uh, blood cholesterol level. We'll help, produce some, we'll help reduce the risk of cancer and so forth. Those are standard health claims. Over the years since 1990, um, whenever the FDA refused a health claim, the company that wanted that claim would take the FDA to court, and the courts in general ruled in favor of the companies on the grounds of the First Amendment and freedom of speech, saying that companies had a right to advertise their products any way they wanted to. And while it's hard for me to understand the, or to think that the founding fathers of the United States uh, invented the First Amendment to protect the right of cereal manufacturers to make claims like this, that's how the courts have interpreted it. And so over the years, the health claim situation has become more and more absurd. Here is um, a Kellogg cereal, why not? We're close. Uh, and it has six different kinds of health claims on this package. In the upper right-hand corner, it's got um, little tokens that tell you about the nutrients that are in the product. It's going to make you smart. It's going to give you a healthy heart. Um, it has zero grams trans fat. I'm so relieved. Um, it's going to lower both blood pressure and cholesterol. And it has an endorsement from the American Heart Association, which only cares about fat and cholesterol and does not care that sugars appear nine times in the ingredient list. Health claims are calorie distractors. Um, Omega-3s are the um, nutrient of the moment. And omega-3s are in everything. They're in milk. They're in peanut butter. They're in mayonnaise. They're in Oreo-type cookies. Um, they're calorie distractors. Um, and the companies are using this strategy and then um, setting up their own set of nutritional criteria and then judging their own products on the basis of those criteria. So uh, PepsiCo, for example, uh, has this smart choices made easy, this little sticker that it puts on its products um, to, that, to identify the ones that are smart choices. And when I've asked PepsiCo officials saying, you're advertising these foods as if they were health foods. The PepsiCo people say, oh, no, 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 that's not true. We're not claiming they're healthy. We're just claiming that they're better choices. Um, calorie distractors. Um, so here are some vitamins on a craft product. They do exactly the same thing. They have the sensible solution, um, identifying the better for you products. Um, so here is a product that no nutritionist would claim as a health food, and yet the package is covered with indications of the vitamins and um, wh what a healthy food it is. So if you're a mother looking for a healthy food, or a father looking for a healthy food for your child in a supermarket, you're going to see, oh, look at that. Doesn't that look terrific? And you will buy it. Um, Antioxidants are in everything these days. They're the also nutrients of the moment. And um, somebody's just been watching what's been happening with antioxidants in the last couple of years. And the number of products claiming to have anti anti antioxidants in them um, has gone up almost tenfold over that period. And here are some, f and, and in fact, the antioxidant situation has gotten so bad that even natural foods are having to advertise themselves as if they have antioxidants in order to compete with all the packaged foods that do. So it's not enough that blueberries are bold, bright, and beautiful. They're now na nature's number one an antioxidant fruit. And it's not enough that tomatoes, are, when they're in season, are delicious. They now are high in lycopene. And it's not enough that uh, pomegranate is good. You can now get it in pill form, or uh, you can get it in jelly belly form. That's what it says, a high in antioxidant vitamin C. Um, these are calorie distractors. They're ways of encouraging you to buy food that you might not ordinarily buy. I just pulled this advertisement out of the magazine, Eating Well, for a Kraft cheese that has no added growth hormone, hormones. 
That's a calorie distractor. Um, and then this is one of my favorites. This is real. Somebody, one of my students brought this in. They pulled it off a banana. Bananas don't have any fat. Of course they don't have any fat. Um, and then one of my students brought this in and said, pretty soon apples are going to be advertised with no high fructose corn syrup. That's a joke. Sorry. Uh, now, I haven't said anything up until now about marketing to children, but I want to say something about it because um, it's one thing. You're an adult. One of the things about being an adult is you get to eat anything you want, anytime you want it. That's one of the great things about adulthood. Um, and you get to exercise your own personal responsibility. But with kids, it's different because parents are making the choices for them or should be making the choices for them. Um, in 2005, the end of 2005, the Institute of Medicine did a major study that um, showed that, that it did a, a research study that looked at all of the research that was available on marketing uh, foods directly to children, bypassing parents and marketing directly to children. And they looked at 123 studies and they looked at the entire research enterprise that is devoted to teaching food companies how to market to children, the methods that they use, uh, the, ex the amount of money that they spend on doing that research, the effect that it has on sales of products, the effect that it has on children's choices of foods, and the effect that it has on children's health. And they came to uh, really some very chilling conclusions about how cynical the whole marketing to children enterprise is. And and how much money is spent on it? I, I mean, there's a big disagreement about the total dollar value of the amount, amount spent on food companies, spent on marketing directly to children. Um, and it ranges from two million to about 10 million, two billion to about 10 billion a year. It doesn't matter. The numbers are too big for me to comprehend anyway. So I just like to show this one example. Uh, Kellogg's in 2007 spent 32.8 million dollars just to advertise Cheez-Its, just on Cheez-Its. And that's only for radio, television, and print. There's a lot of money being spent on nationally advertised products. Now, there are three reasons why companies would like to market to children. The first is brand loyalty. The idea is if you prefer Coke as a child, you will prefer Coke over Pepsi throughout life. The second is what the research to children industry calls the pester factor. And you know exactly what that is. All you have to do is take a two-year-old into a supermarket and watch that child make a beeline um, for the products with cartoons on them. That's the pester factor, asking parents to buy, not, not only asking parents to buy particular food products, but also using very intelligent logic and reasons for, for the parents to do that. That's where those nutrients come in. But I think the third reason is the one that's the most troubling, and it really does disturb me, and that is what food marketing to children is trying to do is to convince kids that they're supposed to eat kids' food. They're not supposed to eat the boring food that adults are supposed to be eating. They're supposed to be eating foods made specially for them. Kid cuisine, foods in funny packages and funny colors, unidentified food objects, um, <laughs> You know, whatever. They're not supposed to eat what their parents are eating. And what this does is turn the control over what kids are eating to the kids themselves. And I think this is so subversive of parental responsibility and parental authority over kids' diet that it is reason enough for taking a very cold, hard look at food industry marketing to children. Um, part of what happens with all of this is that children are, is that marketers are able to uh, through this labeling scheme to label foods as healthy this one because again of the nutritionism piece of it this product uh, has cheese in it it's therefore it's an excellent source of calcium therefore it's a craft sensible solution even though sugar there's a full ounce of sugar in this product and uh, it meets 25% of the day's allotment of sodium and saturated fat. Um, and so you see a lot of this in supermarkets. Now, 
in response to people like me and lots of other people who are complaining about these kinds of things, a lot of pressure has been put on food companies. And companies have said that they're going to stop marketing to children and that they're going to make healthier products. And Kellogg's has taken a lead in making these kinds of announcements. Um, but I want to talk about what Kellogg's is actually doing. I mean, it may be doing some of that, but on the ground it looks quite differently. I do a lot of traveling, and I was in India last fall uh, in um, giving a speech there, and I don't know what other people when, do when they go to India. They probably get to the Taj Mahal, which I never got to. Um, but I did get to a grocery store in New Delhi, and <laughs> I picked up this box of Kellogg's. I'm sorry to pick on Kellogg's, but they do make it easy. The... Um, <laughs> Uh, I picked up this box of Kellogg's Chocos. When I paid for it, they gave me this little children's game, a video game. So this is clearly being marketed directly to children. But what amazed me was what was on the back of the box because it said, getting your child to eat breakfast can be a struggle and one serving of Chocos cereal has the fiber of two chapatis, it has all the, the calcium of two glasses of milk and all these vitamins and minerals in it. So this product is being deliberately marketed to change the diet of Indian food, ch food children from chapatis and whatever they're eating with those chapatis to Chocos cereal. Um, I didn't think that was such a great idea. I was also in Adelaide, um, and I was astounded by the amount of marketing of children's food products with Shrek labeling on them. Um, in this particular grocery store I was in in Adelaide, the, uh, there must have been 20 or 30 separate displays of Shrek advertised products, all of them junk foods of one kind or another. And the only one of them that came even close to being a fruit or vegetable was Fruit Loop cereal, which at least had the goodness of vegetables. Um, now, Shrek is interesting because everybody likes Shrek, and our Department of Health and Human Services like Shrek, and they made a deal with DreamWorks and got Shrek to, were able to use the Shrek char character to promote an exercise program um, on the internet. And this was so shocking to critics of it um, that the New York Times actually wrote an editorial in which they said, if you eat the kind of food that Shrek promotes, you're going to become, you look just like him, and then you're really going to need to exercise. Um, so that's Shrek. So all of this together is, um, you know, is sort of a... It's not a, I, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, so I wouldn't call it that, but I would say that just as the normal course of doing business in our economy, uh, the food industry, health professionals, and the, and the government have collaborated to create a food environment that encourages people to eat more, not less. And that you as an individual in that environment have to figure out how to deal with it which is a lot to take on for one individual. Um, so I want to switch here for just a few minutes and talk about the other aspect of my work. I can't resist talking about this because it's so much fun to do. Uh, this is my book, Pet Food Politics, which just came out, and it came out almost in exactly the same week as the infant formula crisis in China. Um, where melamine, this chemical, was put into infant formula in China. That's exactly what my book is about and what happened in the pet food. And for those of you who don't remember the pet food crisis, it started with a bunch of cats getting sick in February 2007. Um, and these were discovered on some testing done by the, um, by the maker of the pet foods. And the result was the largest recall of consumer products in American history at that time, they, they, ca they called back 60 million cans and pouches of wet pet food, that is pet, pet foods made with water, 95 brands of pet food, actually it ended up being about 200 brands by the time it was over. Um, and these were recalled because they had this chemical melamine, which you usually think of as um, being the, a component of plastic dinnerware. Um, a lot of this plastic dinnerware is made in China. This is a melamine fa factory. Um, and there's lots and lots of melamine around. It's a compound that 
has a lot of nitrogen in it. This is melamine. For the chemists among you, this is melamine. It has a lot of nitrogen. It's 67% nitrogen. And the reason that melamine was put into pet food was because the test for protein um, only looks at nitrogen and it doesn't care where the nitrogen comes from. So you can fraudulently put melamine into anything that contains, that's supposed to contain protein. And it'll look like it has a lot of protein, but it really doesn't. It has this chemical in it, um, which as it turns out, when this chemical mixes with one of its byproducts, it forms crystals in the kidneys of animals and of young children. Um, and the, the pet food recall, which I thought was a completely fascinating example of failure of food safety systems, had enormous implications, I thought. I thought it had a big impact on the pet food industry, which has had to figure out where its ingredients come from. It exposed failures in the United States food safety system and failures in the FDA's ability to protect the food supply. It made it clear that we weren't looking carefully enough at imports. Um, it had a big impact on foreign relations with China, which is where this was all happening. And I think it had implications for our food culture and our food systems as well. And so I wrote the book as kind of a warning of all of, of, of what was going to happen. Um, and one of the points that, that, ca that came across in my research for that book was that one, one of the reasons I thought pet foods were worth writing about was that you can't, set, you can't separate pet foods from the human food supply. They're all part of the same food supply. We eat the same animals, pets and humans. We just eat different parts of those animals. We eat the same grains. We just eat different parts of the grains. Um, and so I was not surprised when um, the same ingredient that had turned up in pet food also turned up in fish. And it turns out surplus pet food is fed to pigs and chickens and the same melamine ingredient turned up in pigs and chickens. So the, the, the supplies of pet food and of human food are just completely linked and you cannot separate them. Now, one of the impacts on China was that China had to do something about its food safety system in a hurry. And among the other things that China did to try to get its food safety system under control, uh, they executed the former head of the Food and Drug Administration and for uh, corruption, not for pet food. Uh, but you would have thought that that would have sent a very firm message. Well, China has an enormous problem with its food safety system because 80% of the food in China is produced in small operations. And these are photographs from USA Today and the New York Times. The upper one is a soybean factory where I guess they were making tofu. And the lower one is um, the place where the initial steps of making the drug heparin occurred. Um, and there was very, very soon after the pet food recall a big problem with heparin poisoning where it was exactly the same kind of problem where it wasn't really heparin, it was some ingredient that was cheating. Now, China is a country in very rapid development and I don't like to be xenophobic about China at all because what's going on in China now is exactly the same thing as what went on in the United States prior to 1906 when Upton Sinclair wrote The Jungle about the meatpacking industry and we got food and drug laws that, ha that have protected our food supply ever since. They're just at an earlier stage of development. And part of their development is shown in the fact that they're now having a lot of pets of their own. Um, and this photograph was sent to me from a pet store in Beijing by a reporter from USA Today who knew I would love it. The Chinese dairy industry is booming. Now this is one of the more bizarre manifestations of development because most Asians are at least partially lactose intolerant and yet the dairy, this is the number of dairy herds and it's absolutely booming and the dairy sections of supermarkets in China are, they look just like the dairy sections of our supermarket. Um, and breastfeeding rates have declined just as you would expect from a country in which there's a big push to 
I have dairy products, and where the arrow is pointing to, the, the lines are, the double lines are comparisons from 1994 to 1996 to 2003 to 2004, and the arrow points to the sharp in the 2004 line uh, in rates of breastfeeding, at least in northern China. Um, and therefore, infant formula um, is, has become very widely used in China, and unless you have money, you can't really afford to buy the imported Nestle's products and other kinds of international products. And so a lot of infant formula is being made in China, and it was very, very easy for unscrupulous um, producers and unscrupulous middlemen to put melamine into uh, powdered infant formula, and that was responsible for um, 13 or 14,000 hospitalized babies, um, a minimum of 54,000 uh, infants with kidney disease as a result of melamine crystals. Um, and many people feel that the number is, should be much, much higher than that. And the, fortunately, only a few deaths. But many of these infants will have permanent kidney damage as a result. So um, the melamine also is now in everything. Now that everybody finally started to look, uh, they're finding it in everything. It was first found in this candy in New Zealand. And this is a very famous Chinese candy. It's what we in uh, the food studies field called an iconic Chinese food. Um, and it was so iconic, it was said to be Zhou Enlai's favorite candy, and he gave it as a gift to President Nixon when President Nixon went there in 1972, presumably not with melamine in it. Um, it's now turned up in all kinds of products that have been distributed throughout the world, cookies, um, biscuits, um, various kinds of candies, chocolate bars, Snickers bars, M&Ms, and now it's turned up in Chinese eggs. Um, so I think everybody should have known with the pet food recall that they should have known that this was something that should have been looked for a long time ago, hence the subtitle, The Chihuahua in the Coal Mine. Um, all of this then raises questions about um, the way between the food industry government, health professionals, and the public, and my colleague David Ludwig, who's a pediatrician um, at the Harvard Hospitals, and I had an article that came out two weeks ago in the Journal of the American Medical Association asking the question, can the food industry play a constructive role in the obesity epidemic? Um, and we talked about the dark side of the food industry and discussed some of the issues I've discussed with you here. And I want to talk about some of the things that the food industry is doing um, that could be perceived as uh, pretty healthy. The, uh, first of all, they invented 100 calorie packs. Now that's certainly a way to restrict the number of calories that uh, people are eating, if people only eat one. Um, and actually most of the research shows that people eat more than one. Also, notice that these are 100 calorie packs of junk foods, um, every one of them. Um, the, uh, the FDA in 2004 had a really good idea. How about putting the complete number of calories that are in a package on the front of that package? Um, what that would get around the confusion. We have a very mathematically challenged population. Um, and it's hard for people to understand that if 8 ounces holds 100 calories, then 20 ounces holds 250 calories. That's, people can't do that very easily. So the FD that the calories be on the front of packages, I to that so strongly that nothing has happened in five years gone by. However, an executive from Coca-Cola sent me a copy of the new 20-ounce Coca-Cola label, which that they're now doing that. And that suggests to me that the FDA must be getting this thing out of, um, I mean, and they're just jumping the gun on something that they're going to have to do, is what I think is happening. Um, the whole calorie labeling thing is really interesting. Uh, the, um, just this week, a consortium of food companies announced that they are going to get rid of the smart spots and sensible solutions, individual company criteria and labeling, 
for identifying healthier for you foods. And they're going to have a unified smart choices program um, in which they will give you the number of calories per serving and the number of servings in a package. Um, I wish they had put the whole number of calories on the package, but okay. Um, and so the question is, is this uh, a good thing or not? And I think it raises a very important philosophical question. And when I'm being philosophical and Jesuitical, um, I can argue it either way. Um, is a better junk food a good food choice? And that's really the question for all of this. Uh, the good things about the Smart Choices program, I think, is it will replace all of the different various company programs, all of which have different criteria. And it uses uniform nutrition criteria for determining whether a product gets a check mark or not. But those uniform criteria allow 480 milligrams of sodium per serving, which is 20% of the day's allotment for a serving, which seems pretty high to me. Um, it doesn't have total calories per package. And what I think is more troubling is that it preempts a traffic light system, which a lot of advocates for public health have been advocating for for a long time. This would be a red, yellow, and green system, where green, you can have it all the time. Uh, yellow, you should only have it once in a while. And red would be only really once in a while. Um, but expect to see on packages pretty soon. Um, so there are some things happening. And in fact, there's so much happening that I think of food as a new social movement. Um, and I think this is something that's happening everywhere, absolutely everywhere. And it's not a social movement. I taught a course in food sociology last year. And it was clear that food is not a social movement in the usual sense of the word, um, in part because the goals are disparate, and the groups that are working on it are um, very different. And there's sort of lots of little mini movements, all of them united by an effort to have a food supply that's healthier for people and for the environment. So um, the movement deals with both food production and consumption. On the production side, there's the good, clean, fair, and slow movement, food that's good for health, clean for the environment, and fair to the people who are producing it, and the slow food movement, which is kind of the opposite of fast food. Um, and I understand you have a slow food unit here in Duluth. It's great. And notice that this is in revolutionary movement terms, the slow food revolution and take action. Um, how about the organic movement? Um, here, the organic movement is quantifiable. Uh, you can look at the increase in sales of organic products since the 1990s, um, right up through the time the organic rules went into effect, and see how organic sales are booming. So this is a movement that, where you could actually measure the extent of the movement. You can measure the extent of the locavore, or locally grown food movement. Um, when it gets on the cover of Time magazine, you know it's gone mainstream. And you can count the number of farmers markets or community supported agriculture CSAs. Uh, they're booming throughout the country. Every market, every city wants its own fa farmers market. And there are so many in New York now. There's practically one on every corner. It's really quite wonderful. Um, there's the animal welfare movement. I was a member of the um, Pew Commission on Industrial Agriculture. Uh, agricultural production uh, gave out its report last April in the medicine line. You could just go get it. And this is about raising animals, farm animals in a way, and poultry, in a way that's healthier for the animals and for the environment and for uh, the people who consume those animals. Um, the, uh, and then on the consumption side, we have the anti-marketing to children movement, some of it led by members of Congress. This is Senator Harkin. Uh, who a couple of years ago had a press conference in which he made the clear parallel between Shrek and Joe Camel. I don't think food is cigarettes, but there are some parallels in the way they're marketed. There's the school lunch movement, um, not only led by Alice Waters and her edible schoolyard in Berkeley, but also in schools all over the country. And I always like to talk about Chef Bobo, who runs uh, the most extraordinary school program at a school in the Upper West Side in Manhattan, um, where the kids are begging for 
cooking lessons and complaining that the food at school is better than what they get at home. Um, and then, okay, those are private schools or those are special schools, but even in the New York City school system, which has 1,200 of the poorest, worst managed, and most physically dreadful schools you could ever imagine, we have Chef Jorge, who is coming in and school by school working with the um, school food service directors, the principals, the teachers, the parents, to try to improve the schools. And I have been to, some, to schools in some of the poorest areas of Brooklyn, really desperately poor areas, where I've seen teenage boys eating salad with my very own eyes. So it can be done. It can be done. Um, there is the rating foods movement. I already told you about the smart choices one. Um, but Hannaford Supermarkets, which is a supermarket chain in the Northeast, a few years ago got an independent group of nutritionists to set up criteria for healthful foods. And then their idea was they would put one, two, or three stars on the products according to how nutritious they were. And what they, were, what they discovered with these independent criteria that when they applied them to 27,000 products in the supermarket, only 23% qualified for even one star. Um, and of those 23, of that 23%, 80% of that were fruits and vegetables in the produce section. There's a lot of junk food out there if you set the criteria high enough. Um, and then we have David Katz, who. Uh, has his own system of rating, and what he's done is to assign scores to, he has his own rating system, he's assigned scores to, de to various foods, and has just gone down the scores one by one so that a soda has a rating of one, and an orange has a rating of 100, and everything else is in between. And he has some supermarket chains that have agreed to start doing this pretty soon. So expect to see scores on packages, too. Uh, I, by the way, am not in favor of rating systems. Let me go on record as saying I don't like them. I think it's ridiculous to make that kind of one-point comparison between one food or another. Um, I just think people should be eating food um, and not worrying about it. The one that really interests me is calorie counting. New York City now has calorie labeling on the menu boards of every chain in New York City that has more than 15 outlets in the city. And let me tell you, there are dozens of such chains. And it is instructive to go into one of these places and look at the menu boards. All I can say is it's jaw-dropping how many calories there are in this food. Even for somebody like me, I thought I knew this, and I couldn't believe a blueberry pomegranate smoothie for 1,200 calories, or a pizza for one for 2,100 calories, when the average person needs 2,000 calories a day. It's having an enormous impact on people's decisions about foods, and it's having an enormous impact on the companies themselves who are trying to figure out how they can scale back on the calories, because it's so shocking how many there are. Uh, the City Health Department, which started this initiative, um, has done its first surveys, and they have asked people, have you been surprised by the calorie counts? Um, and the answer to 84% are surprised by the calorie counts, and are they higher than expected? 97% said, yes, they're higher than expected. Um, this is now a national movement. It's happening everywhere. San Francisco, California just passed its first law. People are putting in initiatives everywhere to get calories on menu boards. Very instructive. Um, how did that happen? Um, so um, I can end here by saying that um, you, I think you, that we need to do personal responsibility and we need to do social responsibility. We need both. On the personal responsibility side, we have to change behavior. But I think really to, in some ways, try to make it easier for people to eat less, move more, eat vegetables, fruits, and whole grains. Don't eat too, this is my mantra, don't eat too much junk food, enjoy what you eat. Oh, and teach kids to cook. I always like to throw that one in. And teach kids where food comes from. And then also, I think as a society, we need to do something about 
changing societal policies. Um, and here, this is my particular laundry list of the kinds of policies that I like to work on. Um, and I think that anybody who's interested in getting interested in food activism, and I would like everybody to be a food activist, can work on marketing to kids, on school meals, on portion sizes, on community food systems. Um, let's get rid of farm supports or change them or do something about them. And then, of course, what underlies all of this are some of what we in public health would call root co causes, uh, which are income inequity, which is just an enormous problem, um, our campaign financing rules. I think if we could change them so that our elected representatives could re pay more attention to public health and corporate health, it would be a good thing. And then I think it's time to revisit Wall Street and take a look at how our Wall Street system works and see whether we can reverse some of the deregulatory uh, tens of the tendencies of the last uh, 20 or so years. Um, so we have our work cut out for us. We have a big agenda. We have an election next week. Be sure to vote. Um, and I'll end just by um, just saying that my book, my book, What to Eat, was translated into Hebrew, of all things. And uh, I was interviewed for a Hebrew newspaper, and they did a cartoon. And it's my first cartoon. <laughs> and I, I'm very proud of it. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks very much. Thank you very much. If you have questions, please come to the microphone here, if anybody does. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, if you have questions, come and... Um, if you have questions, there are microphones here, and you're supposed to use the microphones because it's being recorded. So you'll be on candid camera. Yes. Yes, thanks for a stimulating, if disturbing, talk. Um, you closed your remarks talking about income inequities, which I appreciate. And you started talking about what went wrong in the 1980s with people eating more calories, moving mm -hmm. less, and you gave three reasons blaming mothers, of course, right? And then you ended